people went from having no idea what risk they had to companies being able to tell them pretty accurately, you got a lot of risk. <laughs> and then finally, when you had automation, then you were able to actually start reducing risk. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 287, Automating Dependency Updates with Renovate. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, how often do you sit around and manually update the dependencies of all your products? I mean, you work in Go. That, to me, that is the most painful way to do dependencies. As someone coming from Java, right? We're talking about not only Go dependencies, but in my case, we're talking about images, for example, right? There are Helm charts, there are customized, there, there's a bunch of Kubernetes things that is not even Go always, right? And to answer your question, how often do I update dependencies manually? 100% of the time. I 100% of the time approve pull requests manually that update my dependencies. Uh, so you have a little bit of machinery going on to help you with your dependency management. Or maybe a lot. So on today's show, we have Reese Arkansas. Reese works at Mend on Renovate. Reese, how are you doing? Hey, very well. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me on. So does Victor's response surprise you at all? I mean, he's using machinery. Should he be using machinery or should he just be doing it all by hand? I mean, it is 2024 after all. I mean, obviously I have some familiarity with Victor's setup, so I, was, I wanted to ask a clarifying question. So Victor, you, you said you manually approve pull requests, but are you implying that you have automated pull requests to get it halfway there or that you're creating the pull requests yourself? No, no, no. Pull requests are created by Renovate actually, but I manually approve them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's almost like, I mean... Basically, the answer, to, is it automated? In my case, is yes, but I'm just messing with that. In, it's manual operation to approve it. Automated, but not fully automated, which is a very valid use case. Actually, I was I, I had before, I had it set up to go directly to the main line without any pull request or anything like that. And the reason why I switched to pull requests is not that much because I don't trust my own automation. And when I say automation, I don't mean for the dependencies, but you know, tests and all the other things that I require for something to, to be merged, but because I want to know when something is new so that I see whether I should improve something in my code, maybe there are some new features, you know, I, I want to know what's what's coming in a way. I think the key point is there's many different ways, there's no one size, uh, one size fits all, so, but I, I do have some kind of recommendations. So one recommendation is for people to be realistic. You know, if you get automated pull requests, updating your dependencies, and you always click on them. Like if realistically you're not going to go digging down into source code and, and release notes, you may as well kind of be honest with yourself and say, uh, realistically, I may as well put that one on auto merge. Like if it's patch updates or whatever type of updates you find yourself always just clicking, you may as well auto approve those. Another use case where manually approving is, um, I'll say, undesirable for some people is where they have their own internal packages. So Updating dependencies is not always external or third-party dependencies. It can sometimes be internal. You know, you build base images and then you have this like chain. Victor mentioned Helm charts, things like that. So yeah, especially in the DevOps world, you might have a, a Docker file that has dependencies that you update that builds, gets pushed to a registry that then goes downstream into Kubernetes manifests, you know, Helm charts, customized templates. So there might be times where once you've done the initial work, like updating a base image, you might want that just to flow through without needing you to approve those. So those would be some cases where full automation um, is, um, well, in the case of internal, you could say that's reasonably safe. In the case of third-party patches, you might say, well, it's pragmatic. 
I want to go back to the way you set that up there. If you're not reviewing the upgrade notes or the patches, you should just auto merge. I.e. YOLO, right? To me, that, I mean, yes, that's what we all do, but should we be doing that? It's a good question. So one of the challenges is that a very high percent of updates, especially patch, and but including most non-major updates, a very high percent are fully compatible, non-breaking. You know, in, in theory, in most of the ecosystems we talk about, uh, especially Go, for example, it is quite rare for people to make uh, a breaking change, accidental or otherwise, in a non-major release. And, and we see that reflected in the statistics. But people are worried about that black swan event, whatever, right? That, that one that breaks things. Maybe it breaks your sign-up form and you lose a few hours of sign-ups in a, in a high-volume app or something like that. One of the extra things uh, that's part of renovate and you know in a free free part of renovate is what we call merge confidence and so what we do is we observe at scale um, the passes and failures and the mergings of versions so what victor might be approving is a pull request that actually says this is a week old it has 17 percent adoption and it, uh, it's past 98 percent of pipelines from renovate, you know, users that we observe, that's a lot different from YOLO. You know, that's uh, kind of using essentially crowdsourced data to give what I call it crowd confidence. When we found a way to gather that data and expose it in that way, it was a pretty significant milestone because people went from maybe having a feeling of YOLO to then having a feeling of, like I said, like pragmatic confidence. It's interesting that you said success rate of pipelines, right? I guess that. For many people still simply don't have any validation of automated validation of their source code or application, right? So it's the way I interpret what you just said is kind of, hey, other people who know what they're doing, they validated this thing. So maybe it's okay for you to do it as well. It's a little bit like that. Yeah, everyone's jumping off a cliff. <laughs> Certainly, that's not that's not the in intention. But there's a few a few new nuances uh, to that. And one that we're pretty lucky about is that I would say that dependency automation, use of Renovate, we're, we're still in the early stages overall. There's still a lot of people who haven't even heard of, of this as a concept. Maybe a few hopefully listening here and might be interested after the, <laughs> this podcast. So we're still in the early stages. And, and one of the nice quirks that makes this work is that the types of teams who adopt dependency automation and renovate into their projects are often the teams that do have good pipelines, quality tests, and they do continuous integration, continuous delivery. So we're kind of riding a little bit off the backs of those users who have the confidence of their tests, not just for automation, but for when their developers push changes, maybe even a developer manually changes a dependency. So we're fortunate to have a lot of those kind of early adopters, you know, high velocity, high quality teams. And I think that's what makes the data pretty accurate. And the other thing, um, it's not quite as simple. So as an example, we also have the ability to trace rollbacks. So even if people updated, the rollback is like the number one sign right negative sign obviously so it's not just a one-way kind of confidence we also can know if people have regrets so that's another you know another aspect of it but the rollback can be for many reasons two of them being i updated my dependency put it into production and it doesn't work as expected i'm going back exactly that's that's the reason i'm talking about Exactly, but rollback could be, at least from statistical perspective, it could be, I updated my dependencies, I tested it up, it doesn't work as expected, it's not getting to production and rolling back. But both of those are very strong negative signs that something about that update was off. And then what you'll see is that everyone else benefits from those early adopters and, and rollbackers, right? Because what it means is that we will not have a high confidence in that update, essentially, Anybody else considering that update will then um, know to have some caution or at the very least, you know, hey, don't go jumping off that cliff, you know, just because we said so. We're in fact saying caution, you know, at the top of the cliff. So why would then somebody update dependencies early? Judging by that, it would be in everybody's interest. Hey, wait for a month until other people validated this thing and be a late adopter and 
I mean, I know that the month is not late adopter. People tend to wait for years. Yeah, but. exactly. I, I, yeah, I mean, I'd say it, it's like the classic kind of curves, right? You got the very early adopter, the early majority, the late majority. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in a way, the, the people who do choose to do that are blazing the trail for the rest of us. Personally, I choose to, it's almost like a radio delay button, right? I, I choose to have a seven day delay. So I wait for a, an update to be seven days old and then raise them. And then they pretend, they often, we do have auto merge setting a, a lot. There are people though who are happy to have their projects always up to date and maybe unintentionally they do a great service for everybody else who either, you know, waits, waits a week, waits a month. What's the origin story of Renovate? Why was it a problem that needed to be solved? So the first declaration was um, there was some you know, prior art in the area of dependency automation, obviously very early stage, low, fairly low adoption. I was working on a startup of my own, and we had a problem in production. We were having errors reported by our sentry monitoring to do with our authentication, very obscure, strange errors. And we really racked our brains for close to a week trying to work out what was going on. And then eventually, a developer was working for me, identified it. He said, oh... A week ago, he said, I upgraded the Firebase SDK because uh, they had a new feature we needed. Turns out they broke something accidentally in that release. And the, the sad thing is they patched it almost immediately. We just got unlucky. We upgraded right at the wrong time when it was essentially a broken latest release. And because we had no process in place for updating, you know, we just updated ad hoc. Like I said, we needed a feature for that particular one. In that case, we got caught and, and we spent you know, if you think of time and money and user impact, that was really bad. And I, at that point, basically said, okay, never again. Fortunately for me, unfortunately for the others, the, the, t the two tools I was aware of at the time didn't support monorepos and they didn't support log files. So I essentially wrote a script to automate it just for NPM, just for github.com. I open sourced it partly as a search engine strategy. I used to name my open source after, well, I was building a real estate site, I should add. So I'd name my open source after real estate terms like condo and renovate. I would uh, share them to tech blogs and, and newsletters to get backlinks to my tech blog. And when Google sees backlinks that say condo and renovate instead of dependency updater and software, it kind of tricks it a little bit into boosting your main content. So I, I did that. Unlike the one before that, which was called Condo, uh, Renovate actually got some people really interested and people popped up in the repo, you know, finding bugs, asking for features. And I felt a little bit of a thrill and guilt combination then. I'm like, okay, well, I can't be insincere about this. So fixed bugs, uh, you know, someone wanted GitLab added and, and, and did a bit of work to research it and added GitLab. And essentially just, it just took off from there. Uh, I eventually actually like pivoted my startup away from, from real estate tech to to renovate and that's how it came to be that's usually how the startup wins happen it's not the first project or product it is the second or third yeah and scratching an itch even like slack for example wasn't slack like an internal communication tool when they were building something else and then they get absorbed by a behemoth named salesforce uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's not why Thank we're here today boy yeah. but that would be nice uh, it sounds like the process it went through is you scratched your own itch, you fixed your problem for yourself, people yeah. started enjoying it, yeah. and then all of a sudden, Renovate gets acquired, quote unquote, acquired? Kind of, yeah. So I, 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 just, I found it really thrilling to have developers using it. I had you know, literally been building real estate tech. You, know, you do things like you're looking at heat maps and you're doing user session reviews and you know, the, the classic kind of create a product manager you're watching people click in the wrong spot and saying no no why are you doing that you know and you adjust things and make things more obviously clickable things like that and then suddenly it was almost like a voyeur right you, you know you don't know who these people are really and then um, suddenly those people like in your face saying hi i'm using it this is really great it'd be even greater if you did this or something like that and i really liked that thrill that was what kicked me off the turning point was that someone popped up at one point and said, and I think it was actually someone who needed, you know, mono repo or uh, lock files or something as well. Right. And he said, this is absolutely perfect, but I don't want to run my own software. I'm small. I like to run, have services. And he said, I would like pay you if you ran it as a service, even though it's for free, it's, it's open source. And that was like actually a real turning point. And I started thinking about it and uh, I realized that, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't want to be running their own 
pipelines and things like that. And, you know, running Renovate as a service would be like a viable business, hopefully. So I then not pivoted really, but just converted it into a, you know, open source first, but hosted service second. There came a point, um, maybe after a year and a half, where suddenly this topic got really popular. It was quite surreal uh, when I was in the audience at a GitHub event where they announced their acquisition of Dependabot, which I'd had a bit of a an idea about before that but to see you know uh, the ceo of github and, and and things like that talking about how important dependency automation was yeah i realized it was going to be like a big space and uh, at that time i wasn't my interest to like um, take large risk take funding risk other people's money or anything like that i'd already been working with the the team at mend a bit they'd been interested in the software so we worked out that you know mend had that had the size i was interested in and the joint interests that uh, it would be better for me to join them than try to go it alone in a pretty contested space. I'm always curious about open source projects when they grow. If they're successful, they grow, right? And require more time, effort. How likely would it be for Renovate to exist without funding, kind of based on completely contributions, let's say, right? It's a good question because like my own personal financial motivations to turn it into software as a service actually came quite later in it. It already was building up in in use before that. So, you know, it did kind of exist as a moderately popular open source tool before there was any, you know, incentive there. I'd say it's definitely possible. It's 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 challenging. You know, it's there's a lot of right place, right time. In fact, you know, when I was considering whether to turn it into or attempt to turn it into a business, I mean, half my doubts were like, but if this is such a good idea, why is no one doing it already? Like, you know, I had to really go through all of the, you know, why why is everyone missing this? This seems so obvious that this should be, you know, just like continuous integration, say, you know, that type of automation. This should just be part of software. Why is no one doing it? Like, hard to judge, but I do think so. I think projects like Renovate can exist, but we wouldn't be as successful if we didn't have the ability for people to work on it, you know, on a salary too at times. So was then... Dependable, almost like a validation that this is something. Yeah, yeah, it's a funny feeling because I did not know about Dependabot when I started Renovate. I mean, I literally scratched an itch. So first of all, yeah, I just wrote a script almost. When I decided even to commercialize it, I didn't know about Dependabot. And by the time I discovered them, uh, which is actually when they their founder reached out to me saying hi, I kind of thought to myself, I don't think I would have gone down this path if I knew there was someone else like competent and talented with the same vision. You know, like I didn't set out to compete. I set out to build something that was needed. And then I continued because it seems like there was an open space. So it was it was validation that I wasn't crazy or going down the wrong path if others thought it was great. And then the GitHub acquisition of Dependabot was obviously like the full validation of this as an important concept in software. I'm going to go back to the reason why you created it. I'm assuming you had tried the competition. No, no. So at the point I created, and by the way, I think Dependabot probably didn't even support JavaScript at that point. They started out in the in the Ruby space. I had used one of the two existing services. They were both services, not open source, previously, but I'd had to drop them when, you know, I realized that monorepo, my well, when I adopted monorepos, but also when uh, I use log files. And, you know, a service that updates, <laughs> if it updates like your package JSON without your log file, it's actually like broken. So I couldn't couldn't use them. So in the end it was like I had no choice. So I understand log file not being updated. That's fine. Let's get into a holy war here. Why do you want a monorepo? Yeah. So I was building a service that had database, backend, front end, pretty simple, three components. And I found that even at a small scale, myself and a couple of contractors I had working for me, it was just kind of painful to update the backend and sort of release it or build it into an image and then update the front end, for example. Kind of amusingly, I'd say Dependency automation like Renovate is potentially now one of the tools people could use to not need, you know, monorepos, you know, because when you do publish one thing in one area, you can have an almost immediate update somewhere else uh, and test it and things like that. So this type of automation maybe makes non-monorepos more feasible too. I was about to say that kind of like, why do you need monorepo, man? If you have dependency solution, isn't that one of the main reasons you did it in the first place? A little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was to sort of so that all my dependencies, in a way, weren't dependencies in that sense. They were all in one in one place. And I guess I, I haven't actually used a monorepo since. Okay, good. We'll move. We'll move away from monorepo because that's. 
I, I don't want to get into the Google level of monorepo, but a lot of people go straight monorepo because Google does it, and that's a bad reason to do it. It's not an invalid reason to do it, but it's a bad reason to do it. Yeah, I guess you don't want to go down the, uh, if you're speaking of uh, things Google does, but you maybe aren't big enough to need it, then you start talking about things like uh, Kubernetes itself even. Yeah, build your own Borg. Yeah, we, we've talked about that before. It, most of the time, people don't need a Kubernetes. There, I said it again and again. No, I'll, I'll correct you there. Most of the time, people don't need to manage their own Kubernetes cluster. Okay, fair enough. Yes. You know, you can use Azure Container Apps, which is beautiful and simple. And there is Kubernetes behind, and you don't even see it. I think what we can all agree on today, and then we'll move on for this, container images are fine. How the container images turn into containers, don't do it yourself, unless you have no choice. And there's probably 10 people in the world that have no choice. We're talking about Renovate. You, you built it because of the pain you were having. How many of you, you meaning the dependency management tools, there's Dependabot because you mentioned their name, Renovate. Is there anybody else really in the space? Yeah, so I mentioned, uh, you know, I alluded to competition uh, earlier, and so yeah, I'm glad you came back to it. I don't want to be. Um, well, it's a hard one to answer because I'm really dismissive. There are there are other tools in the space, but there's there's no ones that appear to have. Uh, you say a, m- a momentum behind them. I wouldn't say this is like I- intentional, but I I think that the combination of renovate and Dependabot has like sucked a bit of the oxygen out of the room now because you look at it and you think, well, okay, you know, GitHub is giving away dependency automation essentially for free at massive scale. On the other hand, Renovate is is open source. It's a very, through normal, you know, metrics of an open source project, it's a very um, open project. It is, uh, it has good velocity, has a very wide support. You know, people add new package managers and registry types to it all the time. I think that if someone was to start, like for example, if someone was to start a new, <laughs> I shouldn't shouldn't jinx myself here, but they were to start a new open source dependency automation tool, the number one thing, everyone would just be like, but why would you do that? Like, I mean, Renovate is there. Like I said, it's open source. It's very modular. You can add anything you need to it. So I think the combination of that, that you have a very large commercial provider offering it as a free service, and then you've got a pretty healthy open source project means that. And, and by the way, both of those are you know, free, right? I mean, whether it's open source, whether it's the hosted service I help run at Mend, or whether it's, you know, GitHub's, ultimately talking free. So you're like, oh, I'm going to come and compete really hard against a couple of healthy projects <laughs> for free. And I think the result of that is, is when I say that oxygen's a bit sucked out of the room, it's not like people are like, oh, that's something I really want to do. That, they'll look for the overcharging or underperforming areas of software before they go for something that looks pretty healthy and is not really like, you know, a cash cow. I see projects that use both Dependabot and Renovate. That's what you were just alluding to there. Why do they need both? What, what, what is the compare and contrast like what, or the Venn diagram of this of, to get the whole? So it's not too common to use both because I think developers ultimately want like, I won't say a single source of truth, but a single source of pull requests and they can figure once. Where you might see it happening is that an enterprise customer, especially of GitHub's, might say that they have Dependabot on for security fixes. You know, that's their corporate policy. But meanwhile, you have teams within that company who, for whatever reasons, you know, want to use Renovate and some of its features that Dependabot might not have. So that's like an example of where people might say, okay, I mean, we keep the corporates happy by, yeah, we uh, we tick a box, we have Dependabot, but we also ourselves run Renovate maybe for the non-security updates. And of course, sometimes it's the same update, right? I mean, they may end up having an update to, let, let's say if tomorrow Lodash released a, you know, a security fix because someone finally found a new CVE, they'd probably get a pull request from Renovate and Dependabot and have to decide which one to take and then the other one would get closed. You mentioned security, which in my head is the one of the main reasons why I would keep my dependencies up to date, right? Because most of the time, the updates are not really giving me anything in terms of new features, right? Or better... More often than not, it's security, right? Uh, especially patches. Is there some kind of relation or collaboration or something like that with security tools? So that, hey, there is a high level of vulnerability detected by whatever. Let's confirm now this update or make it happen somehow. 
Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, uh, an easy way of describing is that your your security update, like a, a vulnerability fix or a CVE fix, if you would like, essentially that is pretty much the most high priority dependency update you can do. It's a category of update, but it's the high priority. Um, for some people, it's the only type of update that they do. For some people, they decide that despite automation, dependency updating is still a pain. I don't see enough value in it, you know. Um, and so what they will tend to do is to, I'll be a little uncharitable, you know, they let their dependencies get outdated and they wait for a fire alarm, right? They wait for that alert that says, hey, hey, big problem, big problem. You need to update right now to at least this version. And ideally, they hopefully have a automated pull request, whether it's from Renovate or a commercial provider. Where it differs a bit is it like, Victor, in your scenario where you try to keep up to date, when you get a, a security update, it is probably like a patch or maybe two feature releases at most or something. If you've been keeping up to date and, and you'll be able to look at that release notes. And maybe if the creators of that package are hopefully following best practices, that security fix doesn't bundle a bunch of other high, how to say, um, stability risk stuff. They don't say, oh, we rewrote our entire backend, also fix this critical vulnerability because they may have broken stuff, right? So hopefully you look at it and they say like one line SQL injection fix or something like that. And maybe you'll even click through the source code. Yep, I see the diff. And you'll be able to update it. So you'll have updated and fixed that security before you've finished your first coffee of the morning. Picture another team that doesn't update dependencies. They'll get an update and it'll be like, okay, you have 27 feature releases between you <laughs> and the fix. And they're in a really tough spot because then they have to choose between basically rushing an update without validating it, you know, without doing enough testing as they really should, 27 feature releases. So they can rush it to be safe or they can delay it and say, there's no way we can test this all today. We have to remain vulnerable until at least tomorrow. So, you know, as you're saying, this rock and hard place, right? So if you are using outdated dependencies, you're doing the least work normally, but you really introduce high risk of this situation where you've got to make high stress update fast. And, and that's the difference between, you know, proactive updating and, you know, reactive fixing when it comes to security. I guess there must be also a relation between users who use renovate or dependable or similar tools and the frequency with which they're releasing things. Dora metrics, high performing teams, you release once a day or a couple of times a week, you're more likely to use it. You release once a year and those companies still exist and kind of like, we haven't updated anything for 17 years. Yeah, there's a, there's a high correlation between like high performing teams and dependency updates. At the opposite end, you have teams who they'll add an open source dependency when they need to, you know, oh, adding this new feature, I had to get a library for it. And then they may just leave it forever. They may be using also, um, you know, deprecated APIs, even unknowingly. They don't know that that API is everything. They keep adding more and more technical debt on top. So yeah, there is a very high correlation. And I'd also say that, that that type of user helped a lot because for me building Renovate, you know, there was a lot of people who came in with amazing ideas because it's the that type the correlation there. There was really smart people who sometimes would drop into a completely, you know, unknown code base to them and contribute a really great idea or refactoring even. I think that when you do have something that attracts the early adopter types you can really benefit in ways you don't anticipate to. Do you remember any of those amazing ideas? Whoa, you, you're putting me on the spot. I mean, one that comes to mind, I wouldn't call it an amazing idea, but it blew me away at the time. Uh, I was actually on vacation, uh, vaca you know, vacation from my own startup, but you know, I was on vacation and a guy popped into the GitHub repo for Renovate and he said that like, oh, hey, um, I was thinking like, because I had actually been writing tests and he said, hey, um, I think that you'd be better off if you adopted the Jest testing framework. And if you don't object, I'd be happy to like basically set it up for you and uh, convert all your tests over. And it just, it really blew my mind because it was the first time I'd really been working in this type of open source. I was like, sure, that'd be great. And sure enough, within the next week, he'd refactored it and, uh, you know, adopted best practices for Jest. And these days, although Jest isn't necessarily uh, that uh, kind of favorite or popular uh, to everyone, 
the renovate project has a hundred percent unit test coverage and we enforce that for every fix every feature and it's one of the reasons why we can also move fast and like that origin was you know someone who was a high performing developer dropped into the code base and made a really good change so let's continue with that story you had somebody come in from the outside i'm assuming that was prior to the mend quote unquote acquisition of renovate yeah prior to any commercialization as well even so now that it's commercial as this guy is listening guy or girl is listening to us right now it's like well dang i should have gotten some coin out of that because now it's commercial i mean what's your thoughts on commercial open source so it's funny you mention that because there's there's an extra bit of that story that i wasn't sure whether to add on there when i decided to run renovate as a service as well as open source. I went down that path. I switched from an MIT license to an AGPL with contributor license agreement. That was really the only way. It's it's not a fully defensible mode, but it makes it defensible. And it was interesting because what I needed to do was to track down all the people who'd contributed before that and essentially ask their permission, get them to retroactively sign to use that code. And so he was one of the uh, the people I had to get in contact with and say, hey, look, I, and I was very open. I said, look, I'm planning to change it from an MIT license to an AGPL license. And that's so that if somebody else does say commercialize it, at least they have to, you know, there's a good chance they have to contribute back. They can't just kind of take everything we do in the open and contribute nothing back. Meanwhile, the contributor license agreement would allow me to potentially make my own modifications to it, you know, to run it as a service without needing to just give that away for someone to then run for cheaper than I can. Happy to say I had like those universal support of that. People were like, well done. I, I love Renovate. Anyway, thanks for building it. I really hope you're successful. Like without exaggeration, that was the universal feedback to that. So it was a joy, joy, happy, happy instead of what do you mean you're taking my work for free and making money off of me? Yeah. And then to maybe extend it a bit longer. I mean, there's a lot of commercial open source to, to varying degrees. I think one of the secrets to being successful when there is a commercial element is that it's got to be blindingly obvious to anyone who has doubts that what you open source is like sincere open source. There's a term I use, sincere versus insincere. To me, it, like insincere open source is like, say, the open core, like where people open source like a part, and they may even call it the core but if the reality is they have no interest and they may even in fact essentially put up barriers to having people actually run it themselves as an alternative to the commercial, you know, they're kind of like, it's out there, but like, good luck running it. And that might be software where you got to go and like fully compile it and build it for Windows or something or Mac and, you know, things like that. That's not really, you know, that doesn't fall under my definition of like sincere open source because you're not sincerely happy if people run it completely for free don't even know who it is without permission. That's, we've always, and, and you know, thanks to my employer men for that, we've, we've run it very sincerely all this time. In fact, I would say that probably 99% of the people running Renovate themselves do so with the open source version. And I probably don't know about 80 or 90% of them because like I said, sincere open source, they run it without permissions, you know, without, without, what do you say, needing to ask permission to run it. It's open source. You download it, you run it. I don't know what the figure is right now, but like the renovate open source Docker image on Docker Hub, and thanks to Docker for hosting it, it exceeded a billion pulls in like 2021 or 2022, maybe 2022, something like that. You know, that's a massive use. And that's what I, that's, that's why I like can say with a straight face, you know, like that's sincere open source when you have billions, a billion plus people pulling it. And you're seeing that as a, as a good thing, not, not trying to change your model or something like that. Taking a look at the renovate GitHub repository, you've got the standard, Hey, here's the star up into the right drawing, I guess. It looked to be a fairly linear grow. No, it's not hockey stick because I don't think it was a logarithmic chart. So you were saying you had billions. You did say billions. Of Docker pulls. Yeah. My question to that is, okay, we had this thing back in 2020 that spun the world in. Did you see more then? Or did you see just, I mean, if, if I look at just usage, it sounds like there was probably a big spike. Where are we at now in 2024? Yeah, so I, I think I'm looking at the same same one as you, the uh, the star history uh, chart there, and it is increasing faster than linear. It's not quite. It's not hockey stick, as you say. It's not quite exponential there. I don't know. I don't know the correct term. 
too long ago since I did the math. But like, if you draw like if you draw straight lines at every period there, I think you'll see that overall the number of new stars accelerates. I do have a statement about stars. Uh, I've never stated it before. I'll go ahead and state it now. Stars are like getting a drink at Walmart, fifty cents, and you can have one. Yeah, I read that. I remember that too. To my knowledge, no one's ever bought stars for get and we don't see any signs of that. If you look at that chart, there's not even any tiny blip. So well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Um, Yours look because well, actually, it looks see. more organic. That's why it, f- it feels more yeah. legit. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, although actually, if you to really go and zoom, because I still now now you bring back memories. You know when it was just every waking moment almost was consumed thinking about it, planning it, or coding it. And when someone tweets about you or something like that, you know I check the GitHub notifications first thing. I actually still do. I literally still do. I like that's the first thing I check when people would tweet about it. And occasionally, oh, if I could call it influencers, people with with an audience would tweet about renovate. Or even better, if they worked for someone you know, and they'd say, you know, I'll, I'll make one up because it wasn't quite true. Like they say, oh, at uh, at Uber or something like that, right? Yeah. Back then, you could see bumps. You could see bumps. Given my history, where I actually started it to try to get search engine boosts, um, I also would successfully most times I'd post a picture of the bump when someone had mentioned it. Let's say the victors of the world, you know, like would would mention it, and I would highlight it, and I would put like an arrow, and I'd call it, you know, the victor bump you know, from yesterday, say. And it was really great because most of the times people found that charming and then would retweet that, which meant that if their audience missed it the day before, <laughs> you know, they would see it the next day or two days later when they retweeted my uh, shout out. Or even maybe they saw it the first day and thought, eh, whatever. And then but they see it twice. I think, oh, Victor seems to like this, you know. So that was actually another little strategy I had in the early days. But yeah, when you look at that star chart now, it's pretty hard to see much. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's a sign that... Something is big, right? When I don't know, a couple of thousand view, extra views does not really show on any chart in a way, right? Yeah, gosh, it's funny because um, my CEO one time we were talking about I forget which which whether I don't think it was star star growth because that's not saying folks. I think we we're talking about installs or something like that, and I forget he had a very <laughs> he was saying I, I remember at the time that my assumptions about it were, were like in a way wrong. He was talking about, you know, viral growth. He was saying, well, what this is a sign of is like, you know, that it's word of mouth and not marketing or something along these lines. So it was like, we we're looking at it and saying, it seems that this growth operates. It's a factor of the existing install. But that's right. I think you're saying it's a factor of the existing install. It's greater than linear. And what that implies is that people seem to be finding out from existing users because it keeps going up more. Like he's like, we're not spending more on market. We're not marketing it or whatever. We're spending more on marketing. We're not like, so if you see that it's like three times more growth per month now than it was two years ago, that's a reflection of you know the install base having also grown, which implies that it's like organic references more than marketing. Who doesn't need to use Renovate? I'll go ahead, ahead and say it. people who don't know how to write automated tests. That's a possibility. I mean, I'm I'm very biased on this. My my goal is not that everybody should be using it in best practices and this and that. My my goal is that like a little or a lot Renovate can be adapted to what people need and i don't think there's many people that do like that never update a dependency even if you sort of will say you do it manually i'd still prefer that they look at the renovate dashboard and they go yeah that's the one i wanted and they tick that box and they get an automated pull request the lock files updated the release notes are there like even if essentially they're manually updating like nothing is automatic by default i still would want them finding value from the release note retrieval the confidence scores and things like that Actually, I had a conversation a short while ago, maybe two months ago, with a team that said, we cannot do this because it's too dangerous. We don't know what will happen, blah, blah, blah. We cannot, we cannot upgrade. And then I asked them, okay, so, but when you started this project, how did you choose which version of your dependencies you're going to use? And then they started scratching their heads, kind of, the latest at the time. <laughs> and to me, that's so, in a way, silly, right? You have zero criteria, no criteria what you're going to start with, but then all of a sudden you start be, being afraid. But you started with unknown, for you unknown, but then you start being afraid that unknown should not continue. Yeah, thank you for bringing that. I love that one. Because I, I also say, because people like some people say, oh, but like upgrading to latest, that's so dangerous. And I say, yeah, but 
you started on, I'm like, developers aren't scared of latest versions. They don't have, you start, I, I don't know a single, per, okay, I'll give one example, but no one starts a new project and is like sitting there picking, now I'm going to take the third most release or something like that. No, because you have no reason to know why that one is any better. Maybe the latest one fixed something in the third latest. The only time I have seen people, so I have to, you know, because people listening will be like, I know a reason. It's, you know, it's, okay, sometimes you might say duplicate the dependencies from an existing project to a new one. That's that's like a you know fairly rare case where, where you're like, okay, we've got this set and I'm going to start with them. But yeah, people when people add a dependency, like, okay, I need a library to help me talk to Redis or something. I'm going to add Redis caching. I need to find the Node.js library for Redis. They'll find, you know, what is the probably most popular library and they'll install the latest version. <laughs> They won't even think about versions. Frankly, they'll say like npm install node-redis and it'll just be the latest. And they know that. You know, as soon as that's done, they're suddenly cautious that the latest version is like dangerous. Yeah. Especially, you just said Node.js, right? Especially in Node, Node.js, unless you changed, I haven't been working in it for a while. When you chose that library for Redis, you probably chose 575 other libraries that that library uses that are completely, you have no idea. You just know that half of internet is all of a sudden in that application. Yeah. You know, you just remind me of, you know, there's this joke about, um, it's often, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, I don't think I'm offending anyone here. You know, there's a joke about, you know, someone who says like, I, I control what goes into my body or something like that. And then we laugh and say, no, no normal person knows all of the food chain and what goes into that chicken or whatever you're eating. And frankly, even what was sprayed on the lettuce. I mean, this idea that people know what's going into their bodies it's sort of similar. It's like people are like, no, 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 no. I hand select my dependencies. It's like, yeah, what about the other thousand that came with it? You didn't hand select them. Good. You just offended both carnivores and vegans all in one sentence. I like it. <laughs> Equal opportunity offender today. Yeah. Oh, man. The views will be through the roof, though, with this controversy. Mend. Again, you were, we were saying renovate was acquired. Actually, you were aqua hired into Mend. So that's, that's because renovate at that point was still MIT or had, you were a GPL because. No, I, I, I okay. switched it to, to a GPL. Then, I'm not going to get to the arguments whether a GPL is real open source or not, but it is. So let's, let's just say it is. What does men do? Like what, wh what is the step up? Right. So I could use renovate self host it myself, but I don't need to because. You had a service. Now, effectively, Mend is the service that you used to have, correct? Kind of. Although Mend does a lot, a lot more than just um, just renovate. So, so, so Mend is a uh, you know in the security space. That's why I sometimes call myself an accidental security you know professional. Essentially, both GitHub and Mend bought dependency automation tools for security reasons. That was a stage of the industry where companies got good at telling you you had a vulnerability, but then it would still be up to the developer to go off and fix it. And so these tools were brought in as a way to automate what we call like remediation, automatic fixes. And that had a huge effect on the risk levels of companies. So they, you know, it was like this migration, right? People went from having no idea what risk they had to companies being able to tell them pretty accurately, you got a lot of risk. <laughs> um, and then finally, when you had automation, then you were able to actually start reducing risk. So what MEN does is, is, is not just the updates, obviously, which renovate drives, but also the scanning, the identifying of vulnerabilities, things like exploitability prediction scores and that type of stuff. And, and since I joined, we've expanded. We do first-party code security as well, you know, the classic SQL injection and things like that, uh, warnings and container scanning, various things like that. So renovate these days is essentially uh, a component of a larger suite. And if people wanted to just try out the renovate part, they can. Absolutely, yeah. So our our strategy at the moment is that you know we're either already have or building out apps to all of the hosted platforms, GitHub.com, you know, Bitbucket Cloud, Azure DevOps, where the Mend free plan is is basically Renovate, you know, which is like you know because previously we used to run Renovate as a standalone um, app, we still have it like that on GitHub, for example, but now we're making it so that essentially the Mend free plan. So for people who are interested in Renovate, you still have this, you know, it's fully open source. It's a, like I said, you can run it in one line. It's a Docker run command or an NPX command. It's very sincere open source. But if you're interested in having it run as a service, uh, you even can get that mostly for free. So all of Reese's contact information is going to be down in the episode description. Reese, thanks for being with us today. 
Thanks very much. It was a real pleasure. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there that helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.